Welcome to Infinity Rewatch, the only podcast where we talk about Thomas the Tank Engine 24-7. <laughs> Nothing but Thomas. I am your rootin' tootin' conductor, Andrew Fantasia. And what's up? I'm your angry face tank engine, Ryan J. Whitehead. Ooh, when those things had angry faces, they were legitimately frightening. Like, I think there was one who was always upset. He was like a, a, a cold box car or something and every yeah every time he showed up and he's like ah, that's I'm like, toby Dude. i'm pretty sure toby was the angry one Ooh. or no it was number five the green one was the angry one yes he was green yeah yeah and he's always upset at things Ugh. no thank Ugh. you i mean yeah it's stuff of nightmares but fun fact thomas the tank engines in marvel so for those of you who are questioning this whole thing fun fact Thomas yeah. the Tank Engine had a cameo in Ant-Man. Take that, nerds. Who has a third movie coming out in a few years, which is said to star, among other people, Jonathan Majors? Oh! That's a full right. circle. Trans that's a full <laughs> circle. Oh, that's how we get into the transitions right there. I, mean, uh, I, I guess we could talk about Loki episode six. Fine, if you guys really want. Fine. Let's do it. But, but I mean, we really want to. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. Well, all right. Let, let let's just get into this. I mean, let's let's no sense beating around the bush here. Um, first of all, did did you have any inkling? Ryan, because I didn't. Um, did you have any inkling that Miss Minutes was in on all of this? Okay, so first of all, I was a little concerned because I and and for the record, people, I saw this coming. I saw this coming. I predicted this whole Wizard of Oz experience that we all saw. We all saw it. We all were watching it with our eyeballs, our retinas. We all saw it, and I predicted that there was going to be a Wizard of Oz kind of feel to this experience, and man, did they deliver. And when they came in, yes, I was a little worried that Miss Minutes was going to be all like the big, big hurrah, the big villain. And I was like, ooh, they better not do that because it's not going to pay off well. Did I know that she was involved in it? Of course. I feel like she had a pretty big role to play considering, she, you know, you have to remember that Marvel bases, you know, their stories on reality. So if Kang's like this future, you know, future futurist, probably best way to put it, um, you know, you're going to have an AI, you know, Apple's got their Siri, Microsoft's got their Cortana, Kang's got his Miss Minutes. And you know what? That's the world that Marvel lives in. You're going to have, if you have yourself a little time app, uh, time thingy, uh, then you're going to have Miss Minutes as your voice controlled AI. So, yes, I knew Miss Minutes was going to be part of it. I am. I am the Marvel genius. Now, I've, um, I, I'm not a huge merchandise guy when it comes to Marvel, which is weird. Like, I don't own a you lot fool. of like MCU <laughs> stuff. Like, I, I buy the yes. Blu rays and whatever. But, um, but I think a, a nice, good quality toy of Miss Minutes would be really funky and cool especially if she was kind of translucent like she is on the show mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i actually you know what because i've seen i've seen there's like little tech toys out there that are kind of like um i think it's a best buy there's a display for best buy with the watches and one of them has a holographic display so yeah. why couldn't you just make a little like like even a funko funko i'm gonna give you an idea right now you better get on it but have a little platform and then you see like a holographic Miss Minutes like in a glass case, like AR. I would totally, like I, if I saw a Miss Minutes Funko like that, I would lay down the $12 right there. I mean, it would probably be more closer to like 50, but still, I mean, I mean, come on, Miss Minutes. I, I Marvel build an app where you can just do little Miss Minutes gestures. Like, yeah. The merchandising possibilities go crazy. I think the Miss Minutes app even would dominate. It may sell it for like two bucks. And you oh. can just click on these little things. And Miss Minutes will do them. And yeah, great, great time. And she offers you what you want most. And when you turn her down, she gets really scary and angry. And she's like, well, mm -hmm. screw you then. And then she disappears. 
yeah, and then I, you can you can you can switch to like a game mode where you have to like press the screen where she is and then she keeps trying to escape <laughs> you have to prune her <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly but yes i would love to see some miss minutes uh some miss minute stuff man you could do so much with that so much mm -hmm. yeah the merchandising potential is there loki uh yeah. if you want to take advantage of it but if you don't that's totally understandable focus on your shows and movies guys you're doing you know you're doing a good job stay the course do you're doing great. I mean, we just got Widow, which was amazing. Yeah. I'm sorry, Widow. I have to admit, Loki series kind of just outshined you. Just, just, just totally outshined you. I have to say, I have to say, I feel bad because don't get me wrong. I liked Widow, guys. I know I've been telling you guys on this. I really liked Widow. I did. I loved it. I thought it was a great addition to the MCU world. But if I had to pick a favorite right now, Loki stole the show. Loki stole the Sylvie was amazing. Was <laughs> oh man, the performance so good. Uh, I did. I did enjoy Sylvie. I think uh, out of this whole year, though, so far my favorite new character we've gotten is still Yelena. Um, yeah, because she has so oh, many yeah. pockets. Uh, I love her pockets. Um, it's the total poser. <laughs> <laughs> but man with this show now in the bag um or is it dot 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 there's uh looking back on it like these shows have been so different all three of them and such great quality shows all three but you're right man this is definitely my favorite of the three shows it just it had everything i think a good marvel show or scratch that everything a good mcu show should have everything it ought to have was there and it didn't ever feel like i was watching something that was low budget like i was watching something that was like we can't afford what the movies have i never got that sense not even once I think this is this is where the MCU experience like I, I would just, like I don't even want to say like, oh, this MCU movie or MCU show like it's it's just another MCU story. It's mm -hmm. all stories and, yes. and how they're digested may be different, but they're all stories and they all add up to the cinematic universe. And I agree with you. This show, this sorry, this story, this Loki story is probably the most complete Marvel cinematic universe experience. Like it is, it offers you everything, new characters, new worlds, uh, whole new things to explore, great twists. Um, and the reveal, uh, I'm not even going to waste time because the show certainly did not No, the reveal. The elevator door is opening, and I was sitting there. I'm like, oh, snap. It's going to be an elevator. It's going to take you up to a room, and it's going to be Miss Minutes revealing that Miss Minutes has been behind the whole thing. I was a little <laughs> worried, but then I'm like, no, it's got to be Kang. I even said I even said to my beautiful, wonderful wife, Isabella, I said to her, I'm like, it's got to be Kang. It's got to be Kang. Open the doors, and there he is sitting all leisurely and super classy as ever, and boom, Kang the freaking conqueror what did you do reenact it right now what did okay. you do so this moment i'm like i'm just like like just holding my face like this i was just like it's got it's got to be kang like i'm like it's got to be and i had you i had it's funny enough i had the phone ready but i didn't want to look away so i had it like just like i'll, I'll reenact it for you guys right here i was just like this i was like looking for your messages at the same time of keeping my eye on the screen and that's when, like, when it happened, I just went, like, like just <laughs> pure shock. And then I even texted you, and I and I, this is what, this is the, the messages that transpired. Only two messages were transpired throughout the whole thing. Well, <laughs> sorry. What? Wait, wait. One. Yeah, throughout the moment. It was scanter than usual. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it was, it was about, f about six messages in total that happened throughout this episode. And just before the elevator doors opened, I said, it's got to be Kang. And you replied, I'm scared. And, and I replied, you should be. 
<laughs> and which you replied shock emoji face, which we were all experiencing live in person. And then I replied, holy sh. And that was that was it. I use Asperix, so I can't actually say the whole word, but that's that's what transpired. Holy shasterisk. Yeah. Wow. Exactly. <laughs> you know what I love most about the Kang reveal, Ryan? Is Tell me. Tell me. The second we see him for the first time, before he utters a word, just that one second that we see him when the doors open, visually they're already doing such a good job at showing us how different this guy is from Thanos. Because he's not this this big powerful guy who kind of stands straight back with his hands behind his back or sits on a throne or whatever. And, and, you know, has this, this grim disposition to him like Thanos. This is a guy who is like, you put it casually lounging in this elevator and grinning like a, like a mad Harlequin, just like, <laughs> hi guys, welcome to my big old castle. Um, and that just that image of him with this big, like crescent moon grin, as that elevator opened up, I'm like, this is a totally different big villain than we've ever had before. And that got me so hyped in one frame. One frame. They got me so hyped for such a different guy. And I was like, here he is. Here's Kang. And he's not even blue and I don't care. Because I'm having so much fun. And so is he. He is having, Jonathan Majors is having the time of his life. You can see it. You know, okay, so so Florence Pugh comes in and crushes it. Just crushes her character intro, and uh, you couldn't give it to her any better. She she comes in, knocks it out of the park. Great performance. Jonathan Major comes in, exact same thing. Hits the ground running, doesn't miss a beat, and and he he played with this. Like, this is not someone who was afraid of the cinematic universe or nervous. This is someone who just embraced it. Sometimes their performances, you kind of see there, there's certain choices they're, they're, I kind of feel like they're holding back on. Could have been a directorial position, but other times um, it's, maybe it's just the actor kind of hasn't found their groove yet. And before you guys even challenge me, there are examples, but I'll let you guys figure them out. But there are some examples. Even I will even say I will put Robert out uh, out there already and say Robert didn't fully get into his skin right away. It just he kept building and building and building. Um, and some people, you know, some people kind of went um, uh, Thor, right? Chris Hemsworth didn't quite. And again, could have been creative vision versus his own performance. But it definitely boom like. Once he got it, he got it, but he had to get into it. But Florence, right out of the gate, boom, knew exactly what her character was going to offer and crushed it. Uh, another great example, Chris Evans as Captain America, crushed it. Um, uh, Chadwick Boseman, crushed it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now we have Jonathan Majors and just crushed it. Like, And I, to be honest... I don't think this is the full actualization of Kang. This is a version of Kang, but this yes. is definitely not the full actualization. And that's the beauty of this is that he gets to be all aspects of Kang and, and still remain accurate to the comics in a fun way. Um, so that was awesome. But yes, just cry. the fun he was having the whole time. I mean, as it almost seemed like as a, he was like, he is a huge fan of the MCU and he was both enjoying himself watching these actors perform while being filmed. And at the same time as the character, uh, enjoying what's happening between these two characters and playing, playing with them because that's what they are to him. They, he, they are, they are roles to play in his, in his little theatrical story. Yes. And he, he kind of like bats them around like, like a cat with a toy in the, while they're sitting in his office and they're so confused and, rightfully so because what he's talking about is going way over their head and even directorially speaking they did some really cool things when kang is sitting in that desk and he's talking and you know they positioned the camera between loki and sylvie watching him you know monologue 
And then they would just sort of slowly zoom in on him as he gets a little more intense and he would kind of stop and think of something. And then he'd pick up and start talking again. And then the camera would slowly zoom back out. It was a very deliberate set of technical movements that they were doing. And I love how it it felt kind of sinister just in that regard. You know, just the way he was being photographed was sinister unto itself. And it put me in a sense of unease. It kind of felt like you were watching, like you you said it, like like a, like a cat, like you were watching a cat who's kind of like looking like he's about to pounce. And maybe he kind of hears something and he looks away. And then you make a little noise and he looks back at you and you're not mm-hmm. sure yet. And it, it, it gave me that sense. And it was so eerie that even though the guy is giggling madly the whole time, I never felt unthreatened by him. Like right. I, I always felt like he is, this is seriously scary and this is bad news and we should not be in this room. He, you know, so watching him, watching him, kind of toy with these people. I really thought we were going to see the authoritative Kang, like the one we've seen from the greatest cartoon next to X-Men and Spider-Man, the Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes, which I know my boy, my bro has finally watched and loves just as much as I do now. Cause he totally appreciates what we got. Um, but that Kang is a very authoritative, angry Kang. Like he is a conqueror. Right. Mm-hmm. And I thought, now, I thought in my mind, I was kind of conflicted with what kind of Kang I was getting as a fan because I'm like, okay, you know, this guy is, you know, you need to treat him with respect because he's, he's the guy. He, he constructed the life you live or so, so it may seem. Um, and what's crazy about it, what's crazy about it is I was like, why isn't this guy like more authoritative? And he's playing around with them. And I, and then he, he even calls it out. He's like, he's tired. He's been doing this for so long and he's bored. So when you have someone like someone like Loki come into play, you're going to have fun with them because you're not, you don't have to worry about it. Like you just, there's nothing to fear. Like this is a guy who has the story and he knows how it's going to play out. So, so the fun, so, you know, he probably doesn't get to interact with his subjects. So of course he's going to have fun with them. He's going to play around with them. He's going to totally just like ball of yarn, just like, let's do this. And at the same time, you know, I love how Sylvie's like, you're playing with our lot, like you're playing with people's lives. And to him, that's not the scale here. The scale is completely different. To you, like, get yeah, your epic moments or your your moments in life, to him, that's like sentences in a book. Like, it's like there's so many pages in the whole thing. I know you love that analogy. But it's true. It's uh, But, yeah, like, that's, that's what it is. So to have him be all fun and playful at first, I really feel like, too, this person's, this person's all fun in games until it isn't. And that's what's going to be scary is, like, once the fun and games are over – then we're going to see a very scary Kang. Well, I've, th- that's the thing. I find him so scary already. And I can't wait for whatever like special features behind the scenes stuff is going to come out about the show. Because I can't wait to hear if this was sort of on the page or if it's a, an acting choice Jonathan Majors made to approach him this way. But as he's talking and I'm sitting there thinking, because you know, I was surprised by how how sort of devilish he was as opposed to a Thanos type figure, because that's how I know Kang from those cartoons. But as he's talking, I'm like, this is the perfect choice to make for a guy who time travels so much that he's all mixed up. Of course he'd be a little bit batshit crazy. Of of course he would. He would probably, he probably doesn't even know what year it is. He, like it, it's so jumbled up that would absolutely do that to a person. And I love that choice so much to the point where even when they inferred, like you just said that, you know, this is just a King and we will meet many more versions of King. I was a little bit like, I was like, Oh man, I I really liked this one that we just met. I I hope, you know, if there is a King prime uh, that we're stuck with for the biggest amount of time, I hope he's a lot like this fella. Because this fella had exactly 
what I never knew I needed for Kang. But now that I saw it in front of me, I'm like, that's exactly what this guy should be. You know, I I mean, yeah, I, I wouldn't be upset if this this Kang continues throughout. I mean, in the end, maybe maybe it'll just be more elevated, more maybe maybe with a little hint of anger, like maybe a whole range of emotions. But I agree with you. I mean, I would not be upset if this is the Kang we continue to see in some way, shape or form. Um, to be fair, I can't wait to see him in his full out Kang outfit um mm. to which we get a little taste of later on but uh but yeah i mean that scene th- you know what you know you're watching something really good when you can feel the silence in the room yes i can't there's no other way to describe it but but listeners uh of our podcast thank you guys so much for always listening but you know you know that moment that moment in in your favorite Marvel Cinematic Universe story or in, in any movie or TV show when you're sitting as still as possible and you can just feel the silence in the room. That is when you know this is this is something. This is something. Something's going on here. There are 147 episodes of Thomas the Tank Engine and only nine of them have moments like that. So it's rare. <laughs> But so, okay, so now going into it, not only do we get this fun scene of the test, and it's kind of interesting that he's pleading, like he's not pleading, but he's he's making a deal. He's cutting a deal with these these Lokis. And so he offers them the chance to rule. And so the question remains here is that was he actually going to give him a chance to rule? You know what? I feel like that Kang was so cuckoo that yes, I feel like there was no lying. There was no dishonesty left in that man's body. He was just like somebody. It's the old sort of um, Greek myth of, you know, Atlas constantly holding up the world. And all Atlas cared about was like somebody else pick this damn thing up and give my shoulders a rest. Oh, I love that. Oh my God. That's so true. (laughs) That's possible. I mean, so it's interesting too, because Loki gets to live that story of, of potentially finally getting a throne, right? Getting a throne to rule. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because it's, it feels very much like a Faustian bargain. It feels like a typical deal with the devil where he's offering you all the power in the world. If you, you know, do this thing, that's probably going to screw you over. But the difference is because of how, you know, far gone this Kang is the, the sort of the fine print of this devil's bargain is not fine print. It's sitting right there across from you at that desk, you know, Loki and Sylvie can see him and they can see, sure, I can take what he's going to offer. And then I'm going to end up like that. So there's, there's really, that's why I think there, there's no room left in that creepy castle office for dishonesty it's just like please take this away from me i gotta go to bed mm-hmm. it's yeah and so okay that's fair i do i maybe maybe he's being honest i i think what's interesting too is that you know when you have someone like loki a true kind of villain or an uh, a true kind of antagonist to that kind of character i think being a playful kang is the perfect antagonist because this guy appears as mischievous as as loki does but the difference is that makes him the ultimate antagonist is he actually understands and and has control he is in control right so i love that kind of playthrough now one of the one of my favorite scenes here is he takes off the the time thing he has puts it on the desk and he tells the story of Kang. And it's actually accurate to the comics. Mm-hmm. He actually finds another Kang. And then they talk, and then there's a whole war of Kangs. Um, and, you know, in the end, Kang is the, the, the ultimate Kang, becomes the conqueror and rules and becomes the Kang we all know and love. But that's exactly how it plays out in the comics. Do the comics ever make it clear? whether or not the king who won out 
uh, is from the mainline 616 universe or if he's from something else. Did they ever make it, that? Claim? It is. Uh, yeah, I think it's pretty clear that he's from the 616 universe. Cool. Yeah. There's a there's he even mentions the accurate year and everything like he talks about how he's from like the uh, the 30th 30 30th century or something like that. All that stuff, that whole scene accurate to the comics, like dead accurate. It you could not have asked for a better origin story in terms of the, like getting it that close. Like you could not have asked for that. Were you the like standing thing on your couch like, yes. <laughs> I actually the immediate thing that happened after that I was just like oh my god they did it like they just they did it like they, <laughs> they literally said everything that you wanted to hear Kang say and the best part is is he still hasn't revealed that he's a Richards oh I keep forgetting that detail that he's yeah he's a descendant of the Richards okay but you know it, it's it's perfect it's perfect that he didn't reveal it because that name doesn't mean anything to anybody in this universe yet. It does to us because we've read Fantastic Four comics and watched the cartoon and sang the theme song. But yeah. when when the rest of like the MCU folks meet them, then that can become a big deal. Absolutely. And and the other side of this coin, um, the other side of this coin I do want to point out um, is my coworker, Richard. Awesome dude. Love this guy to death. Um, he was actually pointing out the same thing. He said that, you know what, if you weren't a comic book fan in this episode, you don't really have a full grasp of what's going on. Right. For sure. Because he doesn't and even I, say his name. He doesn't. He doesn't say his name. Uh, but at the same time, you kind of, even the ending kind of leaves you with a lot of confusion. Right? Yeah. And we'll get that. We'll get, we'll get to that. So, so he talks about, you know, and I love this because like, you know, the growth that Sylvie and Loki have is so beautiful. And a lot of the times people, a lot of the times I see reviewers talk about various Marvel experience, like Marvel fight scenes. Um, they always say like, I never felt, I never truly felt the character's conflict and, and why the fight happens. This Sylvie and Loki fight, you feel the conflict. You can feel the the struggle that's going to happen between the two of them it's so good oh man the way oh tom hiddleston the way uh him and that other actor they they truly brought the stakes to that fight and why they need to fight and it's uh there's so many moments like when she even says like why don't you see it the way i do and I love that plea. I love that plea. It's so good. And and oh my god, Loki, uh, Tom Hiddleston's Loki with all the feels, all the feels. I felt every moment he was grasping for. Yeah, and what a great Loki way to say "I love you" without actually saying "I love you." Where he's saying, yes. like, "I don't want, I don't want the throne. I don't want power. I just want you to be okay." Like that's beautiful. That is so it's, beautiful. I mean, you know, you know, I, I'm not like a whole like full on romantic, but there is a part of me that's romantic. And I will say like, oh, my God, I, I felt that moment. I felt that kiss, too. And that's the other thing. Usually that kind of kiss in a movie comes off very disingenuous because yes. it's just like so corny and it's like, eh. but, you know, why they did it. And the, oh, the feels. Oh, Ah, that's so why good. to this day i will if anybody ever tells me they don't like pacific rim i will take them behind the school and beat them up underneath the flagpole because pacific rim aside from being a flat-out entertaining romp has two lead characters who are both beautiful people who get entangled up in a very close-knit friendship and at the very end there's a moment where they could have forced a kiss but because there was no romance at all in the movie the two of them hugged as friends and that was so friggin brave and unique and i will sing pacific rim's praises to high heaven for making that choice and more people need to but you're you're right in, in loki's case there, there was nothing forced about it it was like yeah man I've, i was trapped on a moon with you and we were gonna die you're me but blonde cool and and so i i mean i felt all that 100 percent felt all of it and again the conflict the, the like the why was so present in that scene that you just you just 
you can sympathize, you can relate, you can, oh, just everything in that moment. And in the end, I love it too, because to Kang, again, there's nothing. It's nothing. He had the scripts and everything. He waved it in their faces. Like, it's nothing to him. And and I love that it drives Sylvie further to just go after him. And so, uh, so that is the conflict kind of pauses there and transitions over to the Renslayer experience. And we kind of get the whole Renslayer getting revealed thing. And I loved how they talked. I love how they kind of, again, showed it as opposed to explaining it. Um, you know, you had Hunter D15, I think, or B15, uh, you know, uh, be there and, and be like, just wait. You're going to, you're going to, you know, you're going to get it in a second. And then we see Principal Renslayer, I guess. I guess her name is Renslayer. Principal Renslayer running a school. And this is, I thought it was curious because it's set in, her school is in Ohio, which is where Black Widow and her sister lived as kids when they were pretending to be American. I thought it was very interesting that Marvel gave us two Ohio set backstories in one week. What are you trying to tell us? Mephisto confirmed? Yes, I I agree. (laughs) Because if you take out some of the letters in Ohio and add about nine more, it spells Mephisto. Mm -hmm. True, true. Now, did they did they sh- they shared the year, right? When they were in the school, did they share the year? That I don't know. That's a good question. As I'm curious. I'm curious because what if, what if they try to take? I'm trying. I'm trying, guys, not to fall on the Feige radar here. Uh, but uh, what if the what if uh, Kang went to that school and Renslayer was the teacher and he fell in love with the teacher? And then he came back and pulled her out. That's a controversial romance. He's still a minor. Uh, Well, okay, but hold on here, right? Like, what if he was like, like the Phantom Menace should have been, like, what if he was appropriately casted as like a preteen and then, you know, he becomes a conqueror later and then goes back in time and pulls her into the Time Variance Authority. What if that's exactly it? But when we see that happen in like a movie or something, the first time he sees Renslayer, he's like, are you an angel? They should do that. <laughs> Honestly, that would be a wicked props to the Star Wars universe. <laughs> like in my my humble opinion, yeah, they should totally. And it makes sense because that school was the de- the devils. That was the that was the clue reference, right? The pen. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. So I th- I think it's a solid grounding for story. I think it's I think it's beautiful. I'm curious to see how Renslayer is going to connect with Kang, like both physically and emotionally, because really, as far as far as we know right now, Renslayer doesn't really know Kang, if you know what I mean. She knows yeah. the Timekeepers, but she doesn't seem to know Kang. Yeah, because Miss Minutes is like he did this or whatever, and she's like, who 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 are you talking about? So that answered our question that we've been asking for the last two weeks. Remember about like how, how much does she know? How, you know, is she just like side by side with Kang pulling a bunch of strings, but at least that Renslayer that we've known working at the TVA, she's in the dark. She doesn't know anything about this creepy castle man and a scary Cape. Oh man. It's just, it's so good. And you know, what? actually his outfit, speaking of the outfit we saw, he kind of looks like a scholar, like an old school, like university attending scholar with like the big robes. Yes. That's a very Dungeons and Dragons kind of costume, which like I mentioned is totally going to be the next cinematic universe to take the world by storm. So there you go. Full circle. Thomas the tank engine is also confirmed for Dungeons and Dragons. (laughs) Right. So, okay. So now we have the epic fight scene. We have beautiful love story. We have, um, now we get, we go, we go to Mobius and it looked like they did have something going there. There was a, there was definitely a connection between Renslayer and Mobius. Um, and it really looks like he might turn the TVA into a force for good. Mm-hmm. It looks like that, that actually might happen. So that looks like very promising stuff to me. I loved his scene. Uh, I loved, I loved his scene with Renslayer and so going back to the final fight, now, did you think that, and, you know, I'm not even going to warn spoilers because you guys would have been spoiled like three times by now. Um, did you feel like she was actually going to be able to kill him? 
Like she was actually going to be able to kill him. That's a good question. I think I did. Because like I said, I didn't feel that there was any kind of Palpatine-esque trickery. Like, oh yes, come strike me down. And meanwhile, he's like hiding a little lightsaber in his sleeve. Like I, I didn't get that sense from Kang. I just got the sense like, yeah, you can absolutely kill me. It's just it, it, do it at your own risk. Um, and I, I, I got that sense that that's what Loki was stopping her from. It wasn't him saying like, this doesn't smell right. It's a trap. It was like, do you want to end up like that guy? Cause look, he's crazy. He, he's eating an apple, but he's not a nice fella. Look. Uh, so that I, I got that sense that, yeah, like if Loki didn't intervene, she'd cut him down. She'd cut down King and she did. She impaled him. It was a pretty intense death. You know what? Props to Marvel for for taking for showing us, like showing us the image. Because again, a lot of people were pretty worried that with Disney, it wasn't going to be as um, it was. It was they were going to kind of pull back on the the violence. Yeah. But in this case, they did not hold back. Like that shot should not have happened in Falcon Winter Soldier. The decapitation with the shield. We should not have seen blood, but we did. So, you know, props to uh, Marvel and Disney for for finding a uh, humble ground in which to work in. Um, so, and then what I find is really cool is we see the timeline breaking and going into like 20 different directions in the sky, lighting up like the Northern Lights, which was pretty cool. I really, I really dig that. It definitely felt like an aurora borealis happening in the in the kitchen, but uh, but <laughs> yeah, it was <laughs> no, uh, but uh, you did though. Uh, so so yeah, it was really kind of cool to see that. So clearly, um, Loki is kicked off the whole multiverse of madness. Um, it, it looks like all sorts of timelines are branching. Uh, and it seems like the Sorcerer Supreme or the Ancient One has failed um, because, you know, uh, helping, helping, uh, helping Hulk just didn't work out at all. And now everything's up in chaos. Have you ever seen the James Bond movie on, his, on Her Majesty's Secret Service? It's the one where he's in uh, like the Swiss Alps for the whole movie. No, no, I never saw one. It, it, uh, it has a uh, chase on snowmobiles. And the bad guy is standing on the back of James Bond's snowmobile and they're fighting. And then a tree comes and there's like a, a low hanging tree branch and the bad guy doesn't duck in time and it like breaks his neck and he falls off. And of course, James Bond being James Bond, he has to comment on things. So he turns around and sees that happen and he says, he's branched off. Yeah. And all I could think of during this scene where we see the multiverse is that image. So <laughs> they branched off. I mean, <laughs> The beautiful, the beautiful thing about it now is, I, I personally think, I personally think now that we we literally saw the visual of the timeline breaking and going into all sorts of directions, I think at this point we're due for a Spider-Man trailer, hundred percent. Ooh, we have two Marvel Marvel projects finished. We have we already saw a trailer for Eternals and we saw a trailer for Song Chi. Uh, and we are roughly about what six months, six seven months out, six months out for a Spider-Man movie. Five, five. Then we're definitely August, due for September, a trailer. October, November, December. Yeah, I think so. We're Maybe definitely due like, for a trailer. I feel like I feel like they're still gonna wait. They're still gonna be sneaky. I say either right, right before What If starts. I think that's when we'll get the Spider-Man trailer. That's mid-August, so right? Yeah, I think it's the second week of August. So probably first week of August, you're thinking we get a Spider-Man trailer? Yeah, that seems about right. I still think we're going to get a Spider-Man trailer very soon. I think we might get it within the next two weeks. Um, my reason being is that if you want the, to pull the same momentum of Far From Home being like, if you haven't seen Iron Man yet, don't watch this. And it's kind of like, if you haven't seen Loki yet, don't watch this. Mm-hmm. Because I still, because apparently we all know that Spider Man is having a multiverse kind of thing. So I feel like they can't show footage until Loki was finished. Ooh, that's exciting. And I also heard today, I don't know if it was confirmed 100%, but they kind of, it started trickling out after this finale aired that Loki 
is apparently going to be in Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness as well. Really? Yeah. I did not hear that. I don't think it's um, been super confirmed, but mm -hmm. a few different sources have said it. So, my curiosity here is that are we going to see? I or sorry, is is Tom Hiddleston getting extended? And and by extended, I mean maybe is his contract being completely renewed, or is he just getting a couple more projects? I don't remember hearing much about his contract. I. I, I I know some of the like the biggest ones were Sam Jackson and RDJ. They had like nine apiece. I don't know what the other contracts looked like. Hiddleston's I never heard. But if he was, I mean, he's if he's only been in three Avengers films and three Thor films, and now this, that's seven projects. So that's he could very well still have two in the can if he signed a nine picture deal which seemed to be the norm with a lot of the the other people mm. true um i th i think sam jackson got extended and they they kind of do him his contract on a case-by-case -case basis whether or not they want to use him rdj i think you're right i think it was a nine picture deal um because he had three iron man movies and then he had three avengers movies because you have to count endgame and infinity war as the same one because they were filmed at the same time yeah so that's six. And then... Well, no, R RDJ would have had all four Avengers movies. Loki only had the three. But right. RDJ would have had seven at that point. Seven. And then he did Civil War. Or sorry. Yeah, he was in Civil War, which is eight. And he did... I guess Incredible Hulk counts. I guess. I, think those, I, I know. Because I, I, know, I know Homecoming, that was... They had to pay extra for him to come oh. to do that film. So it was like, yeah, it was like an eight, eight, almost, I could, we could be missing one, but it was definitely an eight pitcher deal. How do you like um, that? How they pay him extra and then half the time it's just a robot suit and he doesn't even show up till the third act. That's just Evans, like Tony Stark, isn't it? Just like Tony Stark. Evans was, uh, what? Evans was three Captain Americas, four Avengers, so seven. Mm-hmm. That's and why then, I, th I think those little cameos count. Like I think yeah. his, his Thor two cameo counts. So, so eight. So he had eight as well. So it looks like an eight pitcher deal. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think so, Tom's I mean, still got some left under his belt. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think Feige really likes Tom because he does good press work for Marvel overall. The yeah, the overall experience he does good press work. So. I think it's i think it's fair to keep him i think that he might keep him around um but of course it's also the fans demand and and of course he's the best like one of the best villains i'm sorry though jonathan majors really climbed that list of villains pretty fast yeah man he's i'm already so excited and it, yeah. it's such a cool fresh look at this guy because all i know him from is lovecraft country and that was a really dark serious show so it's cool mm -hmm. to see him not like play the same kind of character like yeah. I, was I was like, if Kang is going to be dark and serious, like Thanos was, he's it's going to be just like that Lovecraft country character. So I'm so mm -hmm. glad they made him that different too. Uh, and and you're right, Loki, not Loki really, but Tom Hiddleston, they love him. People love him. He he was like the heartthrob after Avengers. Everybody was like, oh my god, take my have my babies, Loki. Uh, even even Thor, he was he was loved. Like they, one of the big things people said about the first Thor movie was, "Yeah, it was all right." But Loki, mm -hmm. like every everyone praised Loki for his or Tom Hilston for his performance of Loki. Yes, and I'm and rightfully so because in the first Thor movie, with no frame of reference beforehand, if you got like you could have theoretically gotten, I think personally, you could have theoretically gotten a movie where Thor was not well acted but if loki failed i think the whole movie would have failed if you get loki wrong if this was 2001 and it was just like i'm a guy with a green tie so i'm loki uh, then you would have fallen flat and luckily we not only got an awesome loki but chris hemsworth did a good job at his first outing as thor so i think that those performances bringing those characters off the page kept that trilogy from getting stagnant, even though the first two were not the most loved movies in the world. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, no, for sure. I, I I think Thor, the first Thor movie, was still was still good. I mean, it, it's flawed. It's, it's it's flawed. Frost giants were weird looking. Um, but I'm told overall, that you said that. <laughs> go ahead, go <laughs> ahead, do your worst, do your worst. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, but in the end, I think the the chemistry between actors in the first Thor movie was still pretty good. Like that's, I think that is the dialogue between characters were were what carried the movie through. Um, and then, then yeah, Thor Dark World just didn't have a good tonality, and the villain was not there. And I, I it's a shame because the actor they casted for that villain, oh my god, they could have done know. so much. What he could have been the, he could have been the comic book Malekith, and that would have been the coolest freaking character. Oh, anyway, that's neither here nor there. Loki is amazing. Tom Hiddleston, amazing job. He did produce this. This is his, yes. this is a uh, big producing one. He's throwing some of that and Loki it, money at it. You know, it's interesting because it seems to me like what Feige's doing with with these actors who've been in the Marvel cinematic universe as long as they have kind of seems like he has a career plan for him because like, you know, they, they do the act, they do the, their acting thing. And then when widow, when widow got her own movie, they let ScarJo uh, produce it. So, Mm -hmm. and the same with Loki. And um, I'm pretty sure even Anthony Mackie got a producing credit for, uh, for, for Falcon winter soldier. So that's beautiful. Imagine in like 20 years, whatever the MCU, you know, phase seven, um it's like the old guard like all the original six avengers and like a few other actors are producing now and like coming up with ideas and stuff and like all the new characters are like kind of their their padawans oh i just got a little bit of of tingly goosebumps thinking about that that sounds like such a beautiful world i can't wait till till we get to a point where we have enough players on the field and enough origin stories have been done that that you can kind of just be fully creative with your own story, like own MCU stories. Like, yes, we are. Yes, you can easily argue with me right now and say, like, r- like Ryan, how could you not think that they're not doing that right now? But the truth is, is they're still kind of trying to find some sort of way to keep the comics in there and to respect the fans, right? But what I'm saying is, imagine a point when like X Men's been introduced. And all these like major villains have been introduced and everyone's got their like, you know, little comic book nods and what have you. And then it's just like, okay, we're going to just do our own story. Like, like, can you imagine a fully free, free of comic book nods and everything Marvel Cinematic Universe story? I would love that. I mean, like, granted, because I know so little about the comics, I, you know, I have no idea what is adapted and what is not until I talk to you. And I'm like, Ryan, what's this, what's this <laughs> reference from? Um, then in, in that case, I would love that idea of kind of, you know, them reaching a point and making that public being like, you know, having that be a thing that Kevin Feige says where it's like, yeah, guys, phase five ended with secret war and it was the giantest thing we ever did. And it was amazing. And we all had fun and it was exactly what Ryan wanted to see. Uh, but now in phase six, starting in phase six, you guys won't have any idea what to expect because we're not adapting Jack. We're yeah. just we're just spitballing it. I would love to kind of, I would just love to see what that world is like, um, and maybe the multiverse will play into it somehow because that's what multiverses are. It's all like you know, mm. what if Superman landed in Russia instead of Kansas, and you get these crazy cool stories. Maybe they'll play with some of that. I I just thought of something right now that might be kind of interesting. I don't know how they would show this or tell this, but you know the Mandela effect, right? Uh, how how it's tied to this idea of the multiverse and there's other universes. What if Red Guardian thinks he fought Captain America because in another multiverse that's exactly what happened, and he's just Mandela effect remembering that. Oh. That would be pretty cool. I would, I would dig that. Uh-huh. I think that would be pretty awesome. I, yeah. I mean, at this point, I mean, you know, sky's the limit here. I actually think personally that with the end of what we have with with the end of what Kevin Feige has planned thus far, 
Um, honestly, once he introduces Fantastic Four and X Men, I think we get into some pretty unknown territory. Ooh, that's exciting. I, I honestly do. I, I don't see how. I don't see why and how he wouldn't like. I feel like with X Men, there is a lot. I feel like with X Men, though X Men has had some success in in Fox, I still feel like Kevin Feige is compelled to deliver a somewhat comic book experience. I don't yes. know what story he's going to end up doing, um, whether it'll be another kind of uh, another kind of retelling of First Class and kind of maybe doing it you know, kind of like the nineties X-Men cartoon where it's just like, it is the first class, but it's different characters that we're not used to seeing and then starting that way. But to me, it just feels like he has to do some sort of nod to the comics X-Men that we need to see. We need some sort of visual validation. Um, and fantastic four, that's the big gamble right now. The fantastic yes. four, uh, because they haven't had a successful run, I feel like there needs to be some sort of comic booky nod to the characters in some way, shape, or form. Um, do I care about who they cast? No, I don't. I don't care. You cast who you want, Feige, because I know in the end you're going to give us an incredible Fantastic Four story that we are very deserving of. Um, so I'm very curious to see that. Uh, but yeah, personally me, I feel like once we get Fantastic Four out of the way and then we get an X-Men or New Mutants or The Mutants or whatever you want to call it, uh, whatever you get out of the way, um, then you're going to just be free to do whatever. I, I personally think we're probably going to see a Knight of the Sentinels kind of story, which is how the, how the X-Men cartoon started with Chasing Jubilee. Yeah. The cartoon had a, had a cool rhythm to it. I, I, I only learned about this, like literally a couple of days ago, but apparently in 2001, Grant Morrison did a run called new X-Men and he treated the world of mutants. Um, he basically, he didn't treat it like a comic book anymore. He treated it like a, a dystopian, not quite dystopian, but not quite utopian sci-fi, like a blade runner world of just humans mm. and mutants intermingling. And like the, the mutants had permeated the culture and there were like famous mutant uh, celebrities and and mute movies uh, like with mutant movie stars and and it just became it was this big sort of melting pot sci-fi story and that sounded really really cool to me i don't know which of the x-men characters were part of the lineup it doesn't matter they can play with that but if that's the world that they put us in for the mcu it's fresh and different enough that it won't just feel like oh it's the same thing where they're they're hiding out under the mansion and then they go up to fight Magneto because he's got a bomb. You know, it, it doesn't feel like that anymore, but uh, it, it can, it can live on its own and it can be part of that earthly sci-fi pocket, like how Wakanda is. You know what? Yeah, I, I would like to see that. I know that comic has been referenced a few times in multimedia. Um, best example is one of my favorite Wolverine games, which, you know, as much as you guys like to think there's a lot of them, there's only a couple that I actually really enjoyed. Uh, one of which is uh, X2 Wolverine's Revenge. Mm -hmm. um, it, not Animatium Revenge. Wolverine's Revenge. Wolverine's Revenge. Uh, it was an incredible game done by Activision, voiced by Mark Hamill. Um, and it was, they actually make reference to that comic book being one of the great Wolverine comic books, like Wolverine involved X-Men comic books of all time. Um, so that was one. Uh, but like I said, Fe Feige's no stranger to X-Men. He actually produced the X-Men cartoon in the 2000s, which was Wolverine and the X-Men. And that story is, if you guys watch it, I do recommend you guys watch that cartoon. It's very hard to get your hands on, but it's definitely worth checking out um, because uh, Xavier goes into a coma uh, and and the X-Men are disbanded. And what ends up happening is Xavier goes into a coma because he saw the end of the world, like the end of the world for not only the X-Men, but for like civilization. And so he ends up reaching out to Wolverine, who's like at the mansion being a loner. And he's like, you got to reassemble the X-Men. I, I, I fell into this coma because I sense, you know, great. I've seen the future and I've, I put my current body into a coma so I can reach out to you guys 
through time and talk to you about this. So it's an incredible story. Um, the animation's a bit, a bit of an adjustment to get used to, uh, but in the end, once you get into it, the story is really epic. Uh, Magneto gets his own island, uh, kind of like Asteroid Emish. Uh, Scarlet Witch has a big story in it. Nightcrawler has an amazing story in it. Uh, and it's, it's really good. But Feige was the producer. Uh, he was executive producer on that show. So if you want, I, you never know, he might actually use that as his template to do the mutants. So it's possible that might go down the way it is. Cool. Yeah. He'll definitely cherry pick from stuff. Cause that's what they're good at. And they'll mm-hmm. find all the best material and put it in. Um, and they'll give us all the goodness that we've been waiting for. Now, speaking of goodness, one of the best parts of this show was the bromance between Loki and Mobius. Except now, Mobius is like, I don't know who you are, man. Yes, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Where Do you think he's back in the same timeline, or do you think he's in a different one? I mean, so many, so many changes happened in that room. Uh, by killing King, and you know, I, I assume it's a wibbly wobbly time travely thing that my physics lacking brain doesn't quite comprehend. But I'll just mm-hmm. make that leap and say, like, okay, by that Kang dying, that causes a bunch of branches. I I'll, I'll get behind the science, even though I I don't understand it. But sure, he's branched off. Um, so I I don't know. Um, I'm assuming because like the temp pad that Loki and Sylvie used to go back to the TVA, I'm assuming it would have been set to where and when they came from. Uh, like the settings on it wouldn't have changed. So I think this is like a back to the future part two case where they went back to the right time, but something has happened to alter it. And now all of a sudden Biff is the richest guy in the world and he owns a casino and he's married to Marty McFly's mother. I think that's what we're looking at here, in which case that's lots of fun. I agree with you. I, I personally feel like it's, I think it's the kind of like the ever present is, is the way I look at it and define it. Um, because the TVA sits outside of time. It's just the ever present because the future hasn't been built yet. So it's constantly being like the now. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's where Loki was. And so when he got warped back, um that's as he's being warped back that's when the kill happened and he lands into the current time which we see the beautiful full out kang statue but yes the bromance uh we get a different mobius who doesn't seem to recognize and that's gonna be really heartbreaking for loki because he really he really connected with mobius yeah I'd, i'd be curious now when i watch this again to see if there's a moment where we see Mobius's expression change in some way to signify that the universe has changed around him. Like if we see that before that big reveal of like, who are you? By the way, statue of Kang now. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if that was on the screen, but it would have been neat if it was. And we don't know where Renslayer went. She's somewhere. She's gone. She's off doing her thing. Yeah. I I have a feeling she might have gone to the time craft is, is where she went. I it's it's so fitting and it's crazy how my mind didn't go to it until the show told me to go to it. Yeah. Um I guess WandaVision and Falcon and Winter Soldier have conditioned us already, but as this is going on and I'm seeing how close we are to the end, I'm like, wow. Like they've they haven't resolved this story. They've only dug the hole deeper. What the hell is going to happen? And then for that final stinger to be like Loki will return in season 2. What a great way to announce a second season, you know, instead of being like, yes, we have been renewed for season two, like instead of being boring and businessy about it, like they, they made that part of the tension of the story. They made that part of the like, oh my God, we killed King and now this is different and now that's different. And where did Sylvie go and where did Renslayer go on? He doesn't remember me. Oh no. What about the jet ski? Season two. Fan bloody tastic is what that was. Oh man, hundred um, percent, hundred uh, percent. I I loved it because you know in the past Marvel has done like Captain America will return in the Avengers, like just simple text and just throwing it in there. 
Um, it seems to me like they knew they had a hit on their hands and they just, they obviously put it forth the, the graphical effects and it, but like you said, it's a nice way to tell the story that this person's coming back and in a fun, in a fun way to do it with the, with the stamp, um, uh, stamp of approval. Uh, oh. and, uh, yeah, no. So, I mean, there's so much potential for season two. Who knows when season two will come out? It could come out a lot sooner than we think. Could come out a lot later than we think. Um, and I know that sounds kind of duh, but like, think about it. Like they already have the set. They have the actors. The only thing they're missing is like what the story is going to be. But to be fair, if they, if they knew they had something good on their hands and they also knew maybe they, maybe they had a bigger story arc to play and they just couldn't do it in the six episodes. I think so. I mean, like it, it didn't feel like this was a rushed thing to be like, Ooh, let's, let's make it two seasons. It really felt like, this was the story they wanted to tell in this one show and they wanted to leave it off on that cliffhanger. Um, mm. And I, as much as I have said in the past, and I still stand by this, I'm so glad WandaVision is a one and done thing. I'm so glad Falcon Winter Soldier is a one and done thing. I, I don't want this whole, I don't want the Netflix formula of like, here's this great story. And then here's a little thing for the next season. Like, because it's going to feel too much like a Netflix show and I don't want it to, I want it to feel like a Marvel story. Uh, so I'm glad. I, I hope that this is the exception rather than the rule. I hope, you know, for every 10 shows they put on Disney plus two of them have multiple seasons. I agree. I agree. I think, I think it's cause I think the expectation should not be that every like, Oh, there's going to be another season for the show. The fact that we don't know. And the fact that they're limited um, makes it that much more interesting. Like, could we see a moon Knight too? Um, I did, I did hear some interesting theories recently as to what kind of stories you could do with moon Knight, as I'm not as familiar. Um, but one of them sounded really, really good uh, to a point where moon Knight had to, steal the powers of each avenger in order to defeat mephisto which would have which is pretty epic see and that Um, still sounds like that still sounds like enough to get me excited uh like not not to keep harping on the netflix shows because i had fun with them but it's like you know when you'd get to the end of a season of jessica jones and they would wrap up the story of jessica jones and then there'd be this weird little scene near the end where it's like jessica jones friend picks up like drugs and she's like i guess i'll do drugs now and the next season is about me doing drugs it's like okay you're telling me there's a season two and she's going to be addicted to drugs in season two but i know her being addicted to drugs is not going to affect black widow and thor so why why do i care whereas with this i know that season two is going to affect black widow and thor because he's branched off so (laughs) i i i care enough now that these little tidbits don't feel like it's just they're trying to fill out seasons with story Mm -hmm. that makes sense it does it does um but yeah i'm very excited very happy that they're extending this particular season i agree with you wanda vision's a pretty complete story Mm -hmm. um and yes you could tell more if you wanted to personally but I also feel that uh, I feel that again, her story is going to tie into and be a very significant part of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. So that's to me, that's her season two. Exactly. Right. Um, if I, I'm still not 100 percent sure if the the new Captain America movie is going to, is going to happen or not. But to me, that's that's uh, Sam's sequel, season two. Yes. Um, so it doesn't have to be legit a direct sequel that way. It can have a small story in someone else's mo- in someone else's story or so on and so forth. Like She-Hulk. She-Hulk, I, I have a feeling she's going to be a very, very big character. I don't think she's going to get multiple seasons. I think she may, may even get her own like movie kind of thing if you want to look at it that way. Totally. I, yeah. I just – because. Because the amount of story She Hulk has and the significance she plays in like Avengers movie or Avengers comics, um, she could easily not only have more seasons, but she could easily have her own movie if she wanted to. And I could be wrong, but I think Universal holding the rights to Hulk movies is the reason why we haven't gotten them in the MCU. But I don't think Universal has any rights to She Hulk movies. So that right there 
That's your uh, that's, that's your little uh, bit of fine print. That's how you get through the loop. That's, that's your ticket. That's that's your ticket. But yeah, so I mean, I agree with you, man. I think I th- I don't think we need like season two for everything. Like, tell me, just I like the idea that you're going to tell me a story that could be digested as a TV show, but yet still make it feel connected and as big as a movie. So yeah, show me what you got, Marvel. You're doing great so far. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh man. Well, Ryan, do you have any l- final thoughts on Loki? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I will say that I, I am so, so happy they introduced Kang. I, it just makes it makes these shows feel like there's big stories a part of the MCU. A lot of people we have we have what if coming out in a few weeks. Um, and there are a lot of people already speculating like that. This might have a big game changing thing to do with the MCU. Um I'm actually the the big thing I'm curious with season two of Loki and the reason why I say sooner rather than later is because if Loki season two comes out before certain movies, we might even get an introduction of Fantastic Four in Loki, if you think about it, because it has everything to do with the TVA. And we know that from the comics, the Fantastic Four has had dealings with the TVA before. So, And it's a sure bet that, you know, Kang is going to pop up a bunch of places sylvie mobius renslayer they're all going to pop up in a bunch of places so i i love the idea of them yes popping up in season two of loki but also you know mobius rides by on a jet ski and black panther 2 why not we know atlantis is there so there's going to be a lot of water so take advantage of it mobius uh yeah i i i just i i second your statement sir i'm so happy with what we got uh, i don't need every show to carry on in multiple seasons, but I think this one um, earned the right to, and it also earned the right to carry on in movies as we know it will. And that's exactly what an MCU show should be doing at this point. So I, I think Loki, the show is just getting everything right. It's getting everything right. Ken said it better myself, man. Um, did we not used to add characters to our book, like our little little entries? Did we not do that, or did yes, we only add you know, them I to think, the? I think we f- we forgot to do that for uh, Black Widow. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're going to do it now. We have our character encyclopedia, and yeah. uh, we are MCU going to encyclopedia. Add, yeah. Yes, our MCU character, and basically it's like any character who was in the comics that they put in. We're going to add them. So. Uh, I guess I'm going to start with Kang because he's the big one and he's the easiest one to remember. Kang with a K. Kang with a K is here. Um, Mobius is definitely from the comics. You've told me that. Yep. So I'm putting him in there too. Where are you, Mobius? There you go. He's right underneath MJ because my list is alphabetical because of course it is. Uh, Renslayer. Ravenna Renslayer is a big deal. What about Miss Minutes? I feel like she's from the comics. No. That's no. made up character. Wow. Interesting. Okay. Who else are we missing? Uh the kid Loki, that's actual character. Kid Loki, yes. Um burp, burp, burp. Ooh, Kid Loki is right underneath Kang. Yeah. It's a sign. Uh, yeah, it's a sign. What else? Is there anybody else? What about... How do, do we count Sylvie as Enchantress? How do we... How are we, Is she Lady... What are we putting her as? Well, I would call her Lady Loki, just to be safe. All right. Fair enough, I guess. And then and then maybe put a, a little forward slash in the middle of Enchantress. Yeah. I, don't, I, I don't know. Lady Loki? Um, with a question mark? Actually, I will make a correction... Uh, for Widow, uh, Mason uh, is a character from the comics. However, it's not confirmed. It's kind of one of those things where they're alluding to a character that mm. may be connected. Uh, and I'll explain how. So in Spider-Man Homecoming, oh the guy who's building all those little inventions, his the last name is Mason. The Tinkerer. The Tinkerer. And in the comics, the Tinkerer has a son who is also has the Mason last name. 
so okay. it kind of ties in that way but it does i don't know it kind of i still say it kind of doesn't count but because it's not fully confirmed but that's that's the thing all right that's fair um and i'll put in red guardian and yelena and yeah. um Did you get allegra valentina defunct <laughs> oh yeah yeah she's been in there since yeah, march I think. um and um What's his uh, General Drakov? Was he? Uh, yeah, I feel like General Drakov's the character. All right, cool. Ooh, wow, yeah, we got a lot of characters here. This is a big list now, man. This was a, a very small list once upon a time, and it no longer is. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's Loki, everybody. That's so Loki. <laughs> Um, are you as excited as I am for Thomas the Tank Engine season 24? Yes. Yes, I am. Um, I hope they kind of reconstruct, uh, George Carlin in some way, shape or form, uh, whether it be through like some digital technology mm. that an actor can wear kind of like what they did with, um, what's his name? General, uh, Tarkov. Tarkin. Tarkin. That's the one. Thank you. General Tarkin. Um, or even, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Something like that. That'd be cool. Yeah. <laughs> and hey, I mean, like, they said there was Ringo still alive, so he can do exactly it. Ringo. We don't know how much time Ringo's got left, poor guy. So use them while you can. Come on, Thomas, yep. get with the program. Wow. All right, Ryan, where can people find you when you're not riding the tank engine through Sir Topham Hat's neighborhood? All right. Well, of course, guys, you can always find me on Twitter at Crusader Online, and then of course you can also find me on Twitch.tv forward slash Xbox Canada every Tuesday and Thursday from two to four. Ooh, I love the rhythm you have when you say that. It's so so musical. Um, and you can find me here in this room that has gradually grown extremely dark. I didn't think I would need the light, so I apologize for people watching the video where I look like I'm telling a scary story around a campfire. And then you can find me on Twitter and Instagram, mostly on Instagram at Andrew Fantasia, on my YouTube channel, Andrew Fantasia, where I talk about movies and stuff, and here on the Rebel Scum Podcast Network, which I hope you like, subscribe to, and maybe even Patreon. Is Patreon a verb? I'm making it a verb now. Uh, where we talk about the Star Wars because Star Wars are cool and there's lightsabers and lightsabers are shiny and a new Star Wars book has come out that I haven't read yet, but I'll be talking about it there. And I also have something really fun coming up later this summer, Ryan, that I alluded to on the podcast a few weeks ago, but I didn't want to say anything yet, but I'll say it now. Um, I have only You're ever- getting seen... the toy lightsaber that doesn't need the glass thing. That's what you get. I wish- I wish. No, I'm Sorry, not going to. I, I stole your moment. Go for it. It's okay. Uh, I, I have uh, a, a video essay coming out, a uh, big one, because I have only ever watched the first Fast and the Furious movie. So, what I did in the last two weeks is I watched them all. And now I'm doing video essays on what I learned from Fast and the Furious 1 through 8 plus Hobbs and Shaw. So. That'll be coming. Oh my god! That's going to take a while to film and edit because that's a big one. So, but uh, look for those probably at the end of August, I think. Uh, I'm just going to throw it in there now. It probably won't take you that long because all I'm pretty sh all I'm sure you learned was it's all about family. All about family. <sighs> <sighs> Oh, well, I hope everybody out there doesn't time travel because we've clearly seen what it can do to you. It turns into a crazy man in a castle. But I hope you all at least eat your apples, jet ski, and above all, have a marvelous day. Hey, scumbags. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up on our video. As always, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Rebel Scum Podcast, for all the latest videos.